Okay, we're good to go, Katrina. Is that, um, hey, hello, everybody. Um, it's the uh, it's uh, not as crowded as I expected in the Zoom room, but I hear there, uh, there are like around 20, 30 people on the stream, so I would invite them to join us here in the Zoom room, or if not, to engage in the conversation, asking questions, etc., in the stream itself, in the comment area. Um, okay, before I give the floor to uh, Paul, my uh, contribution will be minor. I'll just uh, speak very briefly at the end about uh, my contribution to the book project, a book basically about to be published that we're both presenting. And in a way, uh, it offers a sketch of the course that we will jointly offer uh, in this uh, integrated credit program uh, uh, of SMR this year. Uh, so um, I will briefly contribute at the end. Paul will uh, talk for the majority uh, of our time tonight. Um, just very quickly, let me remind everybody what SMR is, and I'll give the floor to uh, Paul then. Okay, so uh, the School of Materialist Research, uh, SMR, is an education and research inter-university grassroots platform uh, that offers integrated credit programs, seminars, uh, mostly open seminars such as this one available for free open to everybody special programs which are also available for free and open to everybody uh, research initiatives that address the materialisms running through contemporary science philosophy art mathematics design architecture and uh politics just a second. Uh, SMR was founded by the Center for Philosophical Technologies at Arizona State University, then the Institute of Social Sciences and Humanities uh, uh, from Skopje, the Department of Architecture, Theory and Philosophy of Technics at the Technical University of Vienna and the Critical Inquiry Lab at the Design Academy Eindhoven in the Netherlands and serves as a global hub for education, research and experimentation at the intersection of the humanities, social sciences, creative fields and the STEM sciences. Uh, you are probably familiar with the abstract of this uh, talk, this uh, seminar uh, this evening, so I won't take uh, time with that and I'll give uh, the floor immediately to Okay, the material I'm going to present in this lecture is partly drawn from the book that Katerina, Greg Michelson and I are publishing, which is called In Defense of Materialism. And the starting parts of the book relate to ancient materialism and classical Renaissance materialism. And that's the focus of this talk today. But I'm specifically focusing on notions of time and infinity in classical and Renaissance or Enlightenment um, materialism. It, I'm not really touching on Aristotle's ideas of potential and actual infinities and the philosophical implications of that for mathematics, but I'm coming close to it by what I'm gonna cover. Now, classical materialism had the conceptual pair of bodies and void, and that was fundamental to atomism. And when Newton writes Principia, he sets about it in a very almost Euclidean way. 
setting out his axioms and his definitions. And among these is the definition of time and space. And a, a definition of time and space had to precede any systematic theory of motion of bodies. And his definitions of time and space are widely quoted because it's on this that the Newtonian and Einstein worldview shift. What he says of time is, as I say, this is cited again and again, absolute true and mathematical time of itself and from its own nature flows equably without regard to anything external. And by another name is called duration. Relative, apparent and common time is some sensible and external, whether accurate or unequable, measure of duration by means of motion, which is commonly used instead of true time, such as an hour, a day, a month or year. Now, this is definition packs a lot into it. He talks of two times. There's true time, which is mathematical and independent of the movement of bodies. Because the movement of bodies is a movement in time with respect to time. But that's not the time we know. The time we know is what he calls relative time. And this time we measure in terms of the position of bodies. Bodies that we know are in motion. So we've got a prior assumption of motion in order to measure time. Now, the motion could be the hands of a clock. By Newton's time, it mainly was the hands of a clock. But as this 18th century, image of an 18th century clock shows, even in those days, clocks still recognize their astronomical heritage. They, this one showed the phases of the moon at the same time as the, the dial, in a sense, shows the position of the sun in the sky. Alternatively, we, you could measure relative time explicitly by the position of the sun in the sky using a sundial. More generally, um, astronomical bodies would be used to measure time. That the example he gives an hour, a month, a day. Those are essentially, apart from the hour, the day, the month, the year, those are astronomical observations. And he applies the metaphor that absolute time flows. And it's a plausible metaphor. But when you think of it, it's surely a contradictory one. Because it's a metaphor based on the idea of a stream flowing. And when a stream flows, it moves. But the motion is defined in the context of time. Can one take that metaphor and apply it to time itself? If you throw a twig down on one side of a bridge, a few seconds later, it appears on the other side. And we then conclude the river flows. So my modification of the, the uh, Pooh Bear image. At time t0, a twig lands in the stream. t0 plus eight seconds, we see the twig. We know the, the bridge is four meters long, so we can conclude the stream's flowing at half a meter a second. But to do that, we must have a notion of time already. We must have the notion of time on a watch or on a stopwatch. And the flow is defined with respect to that. This is a flow in space with respect to time. But what, what was time itself supposed to flow with respect to? This gives rise to paradoxes as soon as you think of it. And to speak of a, a flow of time makes no more 
logical sense than it would be to speak of a spatial distance line. Suppose I plot a graph y equals x squared. Now, I can say that the line flows upwards, the line y flows upwards with respect to the x-axis. I can take the derivative of it as 2x and it tells me how fast y flows up as x changes. And I can only do these things because of Newton's calculus. But I can only do these things because there are two orthogonal axes, the x and y axes. Similarly, if we take a Newtonian equation of motion for a falling body, so that y equals 4.9 t squared, and it's got a derivative d equals 8.9.8 8 t, I can determine the downward flow through space at time t. But again, this is an equation in two orthogonal axes. And that's how we can make sense of motion as being a flow, because the, ortho, the axes are orthogonal. Now, this is not made explicit in Newton's definition, but as soon as he starts treating it mathematically, it becomes apparent that he's treating it as an orthogonal dimension. And this is actually quite a new concept. No sooner does he introduce his flowing absolute time, than he puts it to one side to introduce what actually works, which is relative time. And his sensible relative time is measured by motions. And he gives an example of things like the year and the hour. And these are indeed measured by motions. The image there shows the position of the sun in the sky at successive points in the day. The motions of the Earth around the sun for the year, the spin of the Earth on its axis for a day. So motion is there defining our time. And he's saying we can't measure motion with respect to his hypothetical absolute time. He's already got a relative notion here. Instead, we can only measure one motion with respect to another. Now, if we take a classical astronomer, and he wanted to determine the moment an eclipse of the moon takes place. How would he do that? He wanted to report on the hour at which an eclipse of the moon takes place. It's dark, has, can't see the sun in the sky usually. So, sometimes an eclipse of the moon is visible during daytime, but not, not normally. So, he would be measuring the angle with respect to some to the celestial zenith of some reference star whose position relative to the sun on that day was known. But this is, this is well pre-Newton. Here is a quotation. For we find that the phenomena of eclipses, especially lunar eclipses, which take place at the same time for all observers, are nevertheless not recorded as occurring at the same time, that is at an equal distance from noon by all observers. Rather the hour recorded by the more easterly observers is always later than that recorded by the more westerly. And we find differences in the hour are proportional to the differences between places of observation. Now this is pre-Newtonian, this is Ptolemy, writing in the 300s AD. And what do we have as concepts here? He's using this to prove that the Earth is spherical. Why? Because the Earth is spherical and the sun and the moon are going round it. And that's why things appear at a different time relative to noon for people further to the east. He's making a distinction between absolute time, which Newton is also talking about, is an absolute time, which is given by the simultaneous observation of an eclipse. Now, this was no small matter. For instance, the determination of longitude for, nap, for map making was a huge problem. How could you determine what the position of a colony 
in America was relative to Europe, unless you could have some notion of absolute time, at which you could then observe the, the position of a star. And this point of, of Ptolemy about eclipses was being used as a method. But, and the relative time was being recorded by the observation of positions of stars. What Newton adds is absolute time, not only in the sense of simultaneity, which Ptolemy had, but absolute time as an axis or dimension. He introduced his dot notation. Uh, this is not, no longer much used because of the revolution in notation, which also is not used anymore in the Anglo-Saxon world because Babbage carried out a reform of mathematical notation in the early 19th century, getting the adoption of what we now know as the standard uh, Leibniz notation, dx by dt. But for Newton, a dot above something was a derivative with respect to time. So what's happening here is for Newton, time is absorbed into geometry. The, the equation I had before of a falling body has structurally equivalent form to a parabola, which is well understood. People knew what parabolas were, They've known that since classical times. Now I'm gonna go back to classical times and a classical paradox about time, which is Zeno's paradox. When I did first year philosophy, we were told this still stands as a paradox. I was dubious about it at the time because I was doing physics at the same time. I thought, how can that be right? But at the time, I wouldn't have been able to put it into a, a, a coherent form. The story is Achilles is going to race a tortoise. He gives a tortoise a head start and they both set off and Achilles soon reaches the tortoise's starting point. But by then the tortoise is slightly further ahead. So Achilles starts once more, again reaches the tortoise's second start point, but now the beast is slightly further ahead again. So logically, the argument was Achilles can never overtake. Choose any point, by the time Achilles has reached that, the tortoise has moved on. So what are the basic properties of time being assumed classically. There is simultaneity, as in when Achilles reaches the tortoise's start point, and there's a the notion of before and after. You've got to realize that time measuring devices were very rare in antiquity. There were one or two clocks, water clocks, constructed, but most people will never have seen a water clock. There's no explicit quantitative time scale. So this notion of an explicit quantitative time scale that Newton has is itself a product of a change in the productive forces of society that had made clocks an everyday occurrence, something everyone could see. And again, there is no notion of velocity, explicit notion of velocity in Zeno or dx by dt in calculus after Newton. Although Archimedes comes very close to employing the methods of calculus, it's not for the treatment of velocity. And Archimedes is well after Zeno anyway. Now I'm assuming a, a huge tortoise in my drawing. And I'm saying that Achilles is only five times as fast as the poor beast. And Achilles is giving it a 20 meter head start. So a table here shows the starting position at time zero, the tortoise is at 20 meters, Achilles is at position zero. By the time Achilles reaches position 20 meters, the tortoise has moved on another four meters because it took four seconds. And Achilles races ahead 
By the time he reaches 24 meters, the tortoise has reached 24.8 meters, etc. So it's still ahead. Now let's see how that develops through more steps. What we have is a series that's converging on a time of five seconds as the overtaking point. We can see this series is rapidly converging and you're going to deduce that it must, must be five seconds to overtake. And you can solve that easily or plot it as a graph. If we draw it as a graph, it's clear that the successive time points correspond to two straight lines, which are intersecting. But think about it. This idea of drawing it as a graph would not have occurred to the classicals, to the, uh, to the ancients. Because although they're used to drawing, the idea of a graph on orthogonal axes is not there. Everything is done in terms of Euclidean, not Cartesian geometry. Newton is coming after Descartes. You can write it down as equations of motion and you can easily solve these. Um, we, we have the position XA of Achilles and XT of the tortoise and you solve them for XA equals XT and the answer is 25. So either you can do it analytically or you can draw it. And that's a position where Achilles overtakes the tortoise. But it all relies on a Newtonian perspective where time is a dimension. And therefore it has the same mathematical standing as spatial distance. This is so common to us now, that the, the big shift in perspective that was necessary to achieve this isn't obvious. And that's why we can represent it as a straight line in that because it's a linear equation in, in the time variable. Or, and we say it's a linear equation because it's a, an equation which we, if we plot it, turns into a straight line. Now, Newton introduced the idea of infinitesimals in his calculus in order to specify velocity at a point in time, it's done in terms of a series of shorter and shorter intervals and the change in distance over a shorter and shorter piece of time. And this caused a great deal of controversy because it seemed to rely on ratios between numbers which became infinitely small. In the end, it's, it's resolved by Cauchy in the early 19th century with the rigorous foundation, axiomatic foundation of calculus in terms of limits and series. So the series to the left is easily treatable by Cauchy as a limit series that gives the answer 25. Uh, yeah, okay. Now, if you cast Zeno's paradox, as geometry, it obviously says ridiculous things. It would appear to say that incident lines never meet. Since you can construct a, an, an infinite series of steps between any two incident lines. Uh, and these series of steps approach but never actually reach the intersection. I'm calling it a Zenoic series because I'm replacing the x-axis, the time axis with the x-axis. But what's the material basis for this concept of an infinitesimal? Whether we're talking about an infinitesimal in space or an infinitesimal in time. From the example here, it's pretty clear that it rests on us being able to form an abstraction in our brain of a process of unbounded iteration. We think, okay, we've made this step. Oh, we can do the same thing again. We can do the same thing again, same thing again. And that's apparent in the in, in Zeno's paradox, saying the same thing will happen again. So in order to form this concept of an infinitesimal, our brain must have an innate ability 
to form a neural representation of a process of unbounded iteration. Otherwise, we couldn't think it. Now, you can write down what Zeno is doing as an algorithm. I've written it down as a C algorithm here. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but the important point is that it has a while construct. It says, while the position of Achilles is behind the position of the tortoise, keep on doing this. Repeat these steps. Now, that's expressed in a pro computer programming language. But in essence, Zeno was specifying an iterative algorithm of that sort. And it's a non-terminating algorithm. And that's the, his paradox. His paradox is that the position of Achilles never overtakes the position of the tortoise. That should be XA and XT. It's a non-terminating one. And to, to denote potentially non-terminating algorithms, all general purpose programming language requires something equivalent to this while construct, you see. And this is now known to be a precondition of a Turing complete model. A Turing complete model in a programming language has to have the possibility of unbounded iteration. Now, if, if you look at, I've been talking about smaller and smaller time steps, but extensive infinity is based on exactly the same thing. It's from the axiom that if x is an integer, x plus one is also an integer. From that, the inferences, you can keep on doing that. There's a slight difference in that it's, this is a recursive definition, but computationally unbounded recursion and unbounded iteration are equivalent. So if we take the symbol infinity, infinity isn't a thing, but it's a symbol standing for an unbounded algorithmic process. But what's the material basis for having this concept? And what I mean is, what's the neural basis for this concept? Why does this concept make sense to us? It's well worth having a look at this work by Lakoff and Nunes called Where Mathematics Comes From. They argue that we can do maths because the nervous system provides a sufficient basis, sufficient mechanism to represent uh, mathematical concepts. And I think it's a real step forward for the materialist theory of maths, this. In particular, they show that the nervous systems have an ability or a module that represents unbounded iteration. And this is a basic property of vertebrate nervous systems. And sorry, also invertebrate ones have it as well. And it exists because in general, walking or locomotion requires the brain to be able to handle unbounded iteration. We can express walking in algorithmic terms, in terms of what a robot's computer would tell its legs to do. So I can write an algorithm for walking. While you haven't hit an obstacle, raise and swing forward one leg and push back the opposite leg. Then invert your, your legs. And that, that procedure enables you to walk with two legs. It's more complex if you're a dog or a horse, the sequence of movements is longer because you've got to handle uh, four limbs at once. And it's more complex because the way quadrupeds walk or move is different according to their walking, trotting, galloping, etc. 
which legs are in contact with the ground. And if you are programming uh, a dog robot, you actually have to, well, the people who program dog robots are only able to do it after a deep understanding of the gait of animals. And if you see film of the Boston Dynamics dog robot, it looks remarkably accurate. It looks really like a running dog. What Nunes is saying is that there is a basic neural mechanism which generates animals' gates. And these are called central pattern generators. They are essentially running that algorithm iteratively. And they're relatively simple oscillatory networks. So when a predator is chasing its prey, it invokes these patterns in an unbounded iteration till it catches up or it's exhausted. Now let's look at this. Suppose it's a cheetah chasing a tortoise. Can the cheetah catch up with the tortoise? Well, it's the same quest problem as Zeno's paradox with infinitesimals. To construct his paradox, Zeno is explicitly relying on the notion of running. And running is the archetypal central pattern generator activity. And it's the neural or material foundation of all concepts in the field. But this is very evident in, it, in its first paradoxical presentation. It's actually presented as running. Whereas according to Nunes, it is the concept of unbounded iteration that is, sorry, the ability to think the concept of unbounded iteration rests on a neural ability which was originally evolved for walking or running. So infinity is literally pedestrian. Okay, that's me stopping. Okay. Um, when here? Um, okay, so I will talk a little bit more uh, about my contribution to the book. And um, as Paul said, the book is uh, not literally the content of the course we're going to offer th this fall. It's more the foundation for the course. Um, but I will somehow connect my intervention now uh, with a particular chapter in the book. Uh, and uh, by doing so, I will, of course, expand my argument a little bit and, and go beyond what this said uh, in the book itself or only in that book, um, as it dovetails to arguments that I have made elsewhere and some of the positions I'm going to present are immediately inspired by what just uh, Paul presented, talked about here. Uh, so uh, this uh, project of ours, this uh, book is um, a really robust, <laughs> uh, ambitious project of a certain genealogy of uh, materialism, materialist thought, whereby we try to uh, distinguish supposed alleged philosophical materialisms from what is proper materialism, according to us. Uh, with the help of Marx, essentially, and the late atomists, um, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Paul, we have established that this uh, uh, notion of uh, uh, mechanicity is central to the idea of materialism proper. Um, so uh, and um, uh, this will lead me to the uh, to to Zeno's uh, paradox that uh, Paul just talked about uh, in a moment. Um, let me just explain uh, 
how he, we uh, arrived at this conclusion and what routes we took to arrive at this very simple uh, solution that was in a way present uh, in uh, Marx's doctoral di dissertation already. Uh, so uh, for, uh, uh, mechanicity is a, a sort of processes taking uh, place uh, in, well, the physical reality, it may uh, sound like a simplification or narrowing down of the possible categories uh, we're uh, supposed to speak in and think, uh, 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 speak with and uh, think in uh, uh, in this uh, seminar. Um, but I will narrow it down for the sake of the uh, of my own argument here, because uh, in a moment I will resort to uh, my sources in Greek antiquity, where physis, nature, and matter uh, uh, understood in that way is central. It is also very important to note that Marx himself prefers the no, uh, term physical uh, phys physical and the real to that of material and materialism in fear of polluting uh, his argument with some sort of Feuerbachian uh, materialism, which ends up being uh, an idealism, according to him, inevitably, because it's, uh, it is philosophy. So in a way, he's implied and sometimes very specific, explicit argument actually in his critique of Feuerbach is uh, the following, uh, that the fact that uh, Feuerbach does not manage to exit philosophy uh, is what keeps, it keeps him stuck inside of uh, idealism, still inside of idealism, in, in spite of the idea uh, uh, um, uh, or I don't know the the the, the professed uh, goal of um, instituting, creating, establishing something that uh, would be uh, uh, philosophical materialism or materialist philosophy. Basically, uh, the one cancels the other, according to Marx. Uh, but uh, why and how uh, this? Uh, is um, elaborated in the case of Feuerbach, how this is linked to Hegel and his philosophy and his idealism uh, would be another uh, route. And I will be making a detour and uh, won't, won't be able to arrive uh, at his argument about mechanicity, uh, which we identify in his very, very early work, in his work on the atomists, and in his uh, doctoral dissertation. Uh, so uh, a certain progression in the material, in the physical, be it in, you know, human uh, production, you know, you, you know, human creative activity, productive activity, being in, uh, in the intellectual sense of, you know, making sense of the, out of reality. So uh, being engaged into a cognitive process, explaining reality, which um, I, in my contribution to the uh, book, uh, connect with uh, signifying reality. So uh, thereby, by making use of Marx uh, and uh, and the atomists, I'm also uh, combining my own argument with Saussure's uh, uh, structuralist uh, argument, um, which is basically the same, you know, uh, uh, to uh, talking of reality, uh, thinking of reality, uh, contemplating reality is essentially um, creating a language about reality because it is essentially signifying reality. So this process of signification, just an, uh, as in Saussure, which is, you know, a very uh, material, uh, uh, almost physical, basically. Uh, uh, mind you, his uh, uh, course on uh, general course course on uh, linguistics is uh, uh, focusing on phonetics, um, 
so uh, that is very important. So, uh, and his argument about the physicality, you know, of the larynx, et cetera, are key there in how phonemes work. So he explains the process, which is pretty mechanical in its essence. So I'm still with Saussure, so but this will lead me to the uh, uh, Marx and to, uh, his reception of the atomists and the atomists on mechanicity. But I'm sticking at this point with Saussure so because it, it's, uh, it, it's a good illustration of uh, where I'm going uh, uh, with uh, my intervention here. Uh, so uh, a phoneme uh, next to another phone, a phoneme is positioned according to certain purely me mechanical rules. You know, what uh, uh, sound next to what sound can work, what variants of these two sign sounds working together can be worked out. Uh, these are already intrinsically implied in the uh, from the very position of the two phonemes that the three phonemes, uh, uh, it's usually three phonemes that are a root of a word in, um, uh, at least in the European languages and the proto in the European languages. Uh, so what rules keeps them, uh, rules keep them together? Uh, what rules uh, um, um, imply uh, a certain repositioning of the phonemes uh, because of, I don't know, sim simply uh, uh, laws of, you know, um, eco uh, economical laws, you know, uh, uh, the economy of, uh, uh, of uh, the sound, where it stands better, where it works better, where, uh, where it's, and how it's easier to pronounce it, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, uh, these are very material, mechanical uh, rules, conditions. Yet, uh, after having satisfied these rules, uh, uh, we can uh, develop, let's say, a, a full, morphem or full uh, semantem, let's call it, uh, that's what the way that improvise a little bit with the terminology of postmodernism. Uh, so uh, we can uh, develop the more complex uh, forms of uh, language, uh, but according to the models of how phonetics works. And this is where Susir worked out the, the, the rule of arbitrarity, the rule of uh, uh, differentiation and arbitrarity. Uh, let me just also focus briefly on arbitrarity because it also leads to mechanicity again. It's completely arbitrary according to Susir, uh, which sounds you you choose to signify something. Uh, the same three sounds in a root of a word in one group of languages can mean one thing and in another group of languages, a completely different thing. But how their positions to position to other words, to other sounds, to add, uh, the rest of the rules in the, the language, you know, structuralism. Uh, it's very similar to actually to, to programming, I'm uh, guessing. Uh, judging on uh, <clears throat> what I read about, you know, the early ideas of, you know, artificial languages uh, from the era when linguistics and uh, computing were more in direct uh, connection, the logic of brain branching out is the same. So it's uh, so mechanical, so material, and still it manages to produce something that feel, feels so natural uh, uh, as such a spontaneous expression of our true selves and our thoughts, uh, you, you know, our immediate direct uh, messages or, um, you know, images, uh, mental images that we may want to convey. Uh, it seems... Uh, uh, as such a spontaneous, natural, organic uh, reflection of um, direct expression of things. But behind that, you have the brute uh, 
vulgar reality, you know, of this mechanical work uh, in the concrete, in the physical, in the uh, uh, rooted in the uh, very material, basic, banal work uh, 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 reality of how uh, phonemes uh, and their combinations can uh, can work, uh, and they're structuring into uh, more complex signifiers or signs. Uh, so what seems to be so uh, organic, so beautiful, so sublime language is actually uh, held together and made possible by something so vulgar, so uh, uh, vulgar in uh, square, qu uh, square, uh, square quotes, of course, uh, but it is considered vulgar by, you know, the philosophers. Um, uh, they do not deal with this, you know, like uh, mundane uh, matters of uh, simple combinations of uh, sounds or whatever other element there might be into a structure that is ruled by something so banal as, you know, uh, the rules of uh, physicality. Uh, so the atoms... Uh, uh, behind the material reality work in the same way, uh, in a very similar way. Uh, uh, one had to study literally the mechanicity of the possible combination. One had, uh, one had to be so head, hands-on uh, that, especially in ancient uh, atomism, that it didn't even resemble philosophy. It did not uh, have the, you know, uh, the allure, the, 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 the nobility of, you know, philosophical thought. It was, uh, it uh, seemed like all, almost, you know, some sort of an artisan's work uh, or a, a product. Uh, and so they, they dealt with these combinations of, uh, what comes where? What should the, what atom should have which form? How do we deal with the pro problem of empty space and void? Well, we deal with it by thinking of another type of atom that will be called the void. Okay, will this uh, 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 will this work or not? So uh, all of this is almost you know like having a banal conversation compared to the discourses of. Uh, Parmenides or, I don't know, Plato or um, Aristotle, not so much. Aristotle also wanted to dirty his, his hands with, you know, this material uh, facts of life and discuss them in those terms. Uh, so, yeah, uh, so this idea that uh, what is there in the mud um, uh, so mechanical, so concrete, so uh, as if uh, concrete um, in the sense of um, like a certain uh, aspect of the material reality that is not put into a wider context of interpretation or thought. It's just, uh, you know, uh, something that uh, can be uh, touched, measured, uh, put into certain uh, service of things, but uh, uh, is not, uh, uh, has not been transformed into um, uh, a concept, uh, a, a matter of con uh, contemplation, etc. So I guess I'm using uh, the the term concrete uh, uh, in as opposed to ideal, as does uh, Marx and Grundrisse, or it also very interestingly Saussure, uh, who would uh, I guess he also uses the uh, the term concrete in the sen same sense. So it's, it seems like uh, some sort of a banal chunk of reality uh, that is uh, almost, uh, you know, like meaningless. What do we do with this uh, uh, physical 
object out there uh, without it being put it into uh, put into and transformed into some sort of a, an object uh, and uh, object of contemplation and elevated into a higher form of truth. Uh, so this sublimation of the concrete, th this is where I was going. This sub sublimation of the concrete, this sublimation of the uh, of the material, uh, this sublimation of the um, banality or uh, lack of imbued idea into uh, the physical reality. Uh, all of this is uh, materiality or matter in the sense uh, seen, uh, at least, in the sense in which uh, philosophy never wanted to deal with. It was too banal. It's just nothing. Uh, we can produce some sort of uh, sublime uh, meaning out of. And, uh, and that is why uh, Marx insisted that uh, philosophers like Feuerbach, who still remained moved by the desires, dreams, uh, and aspirations, and the narcissistic uh, drive of philosophy, will uh, eventually end up being idealists uh, in spite of their uh, declared intention and and declared. Uh, supposedly finished uh, project of having proposed um, a, a materialist uh, philosophy. Uh, so um, that's a bit about mechanicity, about uh, atoms, about why we place so much important uh, on mechanicity. I used my own route into explaining the precepts of the project uh, because I have studied uh, linguistics as well uh, and classical languages and comparative in the European, European linguistics. So th that's the easier route for, uh, for me to arrive to very similar conclusions to uh, the ones that uh, Paul and Greg, Greg have uh, arrived um, at. Um, and finally, I just want to add something uh, uh, to wrap up uh, a little bit on antiquity, if there is time uh, for that. In the first two, uh, in the first chapter, and uh, I don't know if the, the, the dialectics, my chapter of dialectics is the second or the third, I can't remember. Uh, in the first two chapters, uh, which I have con Contributed to to this uh, project, I deal with uh, uh, the philosophers of antiquity, and I deal also with the question of uh, not. Uh, I do not deal with the question of Zeno's paradox, but I kind of uh, run into it into it in a way because I'm dealing with Parmenides there. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, or as you may know, Parmenides and Zeno belong to the same school of philosophical thought, the Eleatic school of thought. And, the, uh, and it leads us in a way to the question of uh, the atom or the uncuttable. Um, uh, uh, um, Parmenides, Zeno, uh, uh, kind of gave birth to philosophy as we know it, but also um, aborted in a way uh, uh, its possibility to think the questions of movement, change, and uh, time. Why? Because uh, movement and change presupposed empty space. Empty space presupposed nothingness. And since nothing comes from nothing, according to Parmenides as well, according to all of the ancient philosophers, uh, and even further on, and since nothing comes from nothing, uh, as both Parmenides, uh, Zeno, and uh, Plato, and all the others say, uh, say since nothing comes from nothing, uh, 
an empty space would be nothing, according to both of them, uh, there cannot be empty space. So uh, everything is filled up with the existence. Everything is existence. And this existence is one and unchangeable. Re remember the Parmenidian one and the, uh, and the, the Parmenidian uh, principle of uh, immovability, absence of uh, uh, motion. It is because of these reasons. Uh, so uh, that is why uh, in my reading, uh, Zeno's paradox comes actually comes down to the absence of the uh, notion of time. He actually does not operate with time. Uh, time is actually not even an allowed category in this context. Uh, because time is linked to change and change is impossible because nothing comes from nothing. Um, so uh, one interesting realization here is, and again, it's uh, relevant for the problems of philosophy as such. And it's, I would call it arrogance compared to the sciences. Um, because uh, it turns out that space uh, and the question of becoming linked to it are actually immediately ontologized. So it's, it becomes a question of uh, being and not being, and not a question of being in space or of a certain space, it's uh, simply, uh, so yeah, uh, so the, the argument is ontologized. Uh, since the argument is ontologized, because uh, uh, everything has, has to be filled up with existence, there cannot be an empty space. Empty space is absence of existence, not an empty space, not, uh, uh, not space. Uh, the category we operate with nowadays uh, that is not occupied by a body uh, or it is uh, or, or a category that mathematics or uh, physics operates with uh, it's uh, literally uh, the absence of being and that is an uh, ontological impossibility therefore to think, think in terms of time and change was an impossibility as well I, I think that by my presentation so far, it's, it is clear why. Uh, so Aristotle had to come up with some sort of a solution which opened up the, the possibility of thinking space and change, but still the notion of time is uh, hardly mentioned even in Aristotle. He says uh, time is not, uh, in, and in, in this he's, he's helped by um, his organon. And uh, so devising this uh, categorical system, a system of categories, he can think uh, in with logical precision, precision, which was back then called uh, rhetorical actually. So uh, uh, space, his, Aristotle says, space is not koon nor usia. So it's not a substance or essence. Uh, uh, the usia or um, essence or a certain uh, toon uh, is uh, a certain toti in Greek, a certain something. Whereas he says, Time, uh, sorry, space is not a certain something. It is a certain something in relation, uh, it is a certain relation to a certain something. So you see, there is already a distinction between substance and mode, the in philosophical terms or in terms of uh, symbolic logic. So, or symbolic logic. Uh, so, uh, this is the shortcut that uh, Aristotle takes. And uh, this opens up uh, the possibility of this uh, for discussion. So
So the atomists take it further, and I will wrap up here. The atomists take it further and uh, uh, try to, uh, of course, they precede the early atomists, they, uh, they precede um, uh, Aristotle, but uh, I'm referring here more to Epicurus, Lucretius, and those that come after him. They, they go further and they act, uh, uh, and they basically attack, in a way, precisely Zeno's uh, paradox. Uh, because what Zeno says there is because, you know, the existence is immovable, uh, one and the same change is impossible. It is endlessly cuttable. And that's why uh, it, it's very discreet. And that's why uh, the tortoise, the turtle, whatever it's called, whatever it is, uh, is in a way because it's slow and because it uh, uh, walks this plane uh, of infinitesimal uh, cutability to infinity, it's paradoxically uh, faster than um, uh, Achilles, because Achilles does not, uh, simply does not even touch on this infi inf infinitely small uh, and uh, uh, never, uh, uh, or uh, yeah, uh, infinitely small uh, pieces of uh, space, let's put it that way, even though they don't operate with space, neither Parmenides nor Zeno, it's simply of being, and uh, uh, they could be cut to infinity, to the smallest bits, uh, and Achilles simply runs across this uh, plane, so he doesn't even get there. Uh, that's basically uh, the riddle, I would say, of Zeno more than uh, a paradox. And what do the atomists uh, propose? They say, okay, uh, yeah, we agree, nothing comes from nothing. Uh, the Eleatics are correct. Every other uh, philosopher has agreed with them. They, uh, they must be correct, but there must be a certain uh, uh, element of this infinitely cuttable existence that is uncuttable. Uh, atomos in Greek, and that is the atom. Um, this strangely opens up the possibility to speak of movement, change, transformation, but the problem of empty space stays there. The, uh, the problem of, um, of movement, therefore, uh, therefore, is bypassed by com coming up with ad hoc solutions like, okay, let's think of atoms that are atoms in a way, but they're uh, void um, or they're sort of an empty space. And I think that the breaking away from idealism and the ideal forms that Epicurus proposes, Lucretius elaborates, uh, which is the klinemen, the imperfect line of movement, uh, which creates the possibility of clashes, of interactions between atoms, and therefore, for change and creation is uh, again, a purely materialist, almost mechanical solution to a problem that yields, let's call them metaphysical consequences, even if we're not metaphysicians. Um, I, I, I choose that word because I think that uh, even having a conversation about matter, materialism, and idealism is a kind of a, you know metaphysical conversation, and I don't think that there is anything wrong with it, as long as it's um, carried out without the arrogance of philosophy, but with the art working humility of the sciences. So uh, that's me.
And now I'm here. So now if there are questions, commentaries, comments, etc., please share them with us here in the Zoom, even though most of you are on the stream. So we'll, I'll check the stream, I guess, and hear you just, because there are not too many of us, you just, you know, take the mic and start talking. There don't appear to be any questions that I can see. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, not at the moment, not in the Zoom room. I was just checking the stream. There's some likes, but no comments or questions. Let me check again. No. Okay, so should we wrap up or wait another moment if somebody wants to say something? Lisa, can you check the stream again? Yes, because I'm checking. Yeah, yeah. There, there seem to be people there. Uh, there is nothing in the live stream on YouTube. I'm checking the Facebook. There are a couple, there are likes, but no questions at this moment. So, so I, I, I could ask a question. I, yeah. Thank you for uh, the talk. Um, I guess. Uh, for the end of the slide for uh, polls, when you start talking about like the pedestrian or, or, or walking and, you know, like the, like the programming uh, of, of walking, um, the, so I've been thinking about like um, how like GPS influences um, like uh, our, our motions through the city. And, um, you know, not that our bodies are, contorting you know to the algorithm but I, I guess um if i don't know I, I kind of just was interested to hear what what more you had to say about you know the this nature of walking uh either assisted by algorithm or or conditioned by algorithm uh, or you know or equations i'm not sure if it's not a clear question but <laughs> Okay, the, the, the point I'm making is that if you walk, your nervous system has to be able to go through an iterative process, which repeats and repeats and repeats, step after step after step. And it has to be able to do that until it encounters an obstacle but the, it, it has the potential, if you don't encounter an obstacle, you just go on walking. Um, now, it's because you can do that, that you can think of a mathematical process that repeats and repeats and repeats. If you didn't have a nervous system that was capable of performing iteration, you wouldn't be able to perform or think of repeatedly performing the same mathematical operations. So it is that ability to walk 
the ability to do the same thing again and again in a repetitive fashion that enables the nervous system to form an abstraction of repeated operations. And it has to have that ability if it's, if it's to learn any complicated behavior. So if you want to learn going to work from your home on foot, a component of that is to represent walk along the street, turn right, walk along the street. So you have to be able to form abstractions of doing something repeatedly in order to learn a route, for example. Now, in learning the routes, modern neuroscience indicates you actually lay out on the surface of your brain a topology similar to the topology of the, the place you're walking through. You have some re grid representation of it. But um, to be a the, the point about that Nunes and uh, Lacos are saying is that different mathematical concepts rest on different properties of the nervous system. The concept of infinity and infinitesimals rests on iterative muscular movements. Uh, things like uh, Venn diagrams, for example, they're much easier to understand the notion of intersection of sets with a Venn diagram than it is writing it down as symbolic logic. Why is that? It's because that rests on the ability of the visual cortex. The visual cortex processes things in parallel. If you try and represent set intersection symbolically, you're using a linguistic submodule, which is only capable of a much slower rate of processing. Uh, so the different concepts here rest on different neural subsystems. And the, I gave just the example in the case of Zeno of, of the walking being the archetypal iterative system. Thank you. Uh, the, the other component, like because of the, the robotic dog, uh, I, I start thinking of like the robotic worker, like the delivery worker as robot. And uh, I, I, I'd like to think of like a return of the flaneur, you know, like with the Derives walking through and through this urban space. But uh, I, I was thinking of like, if we programmed, you know, Derives into uh, automated delivery systems, you know, it might it might be more adapted and, you know, like the, the driverless uh, taxis, <laughs> you know, like usually they're just going from, uh, objective you know to destination or uh, they don't have like well i don't know the 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 learning process i guess uh, I was, if you could uh invite like uh like randomness into their learning you know like let the driverless cars just drive you know go on little like uh their own <laughs> solo expedition you know type of thing like their own i, I don't know if that would benefit you know their learning system because you know it, it, it's not iteration if you break out of the habit i guess or maybe it is i mean it, the process the motor process of walking is still the same but uh like I, I, I don't know like and and or destination or telos doesn't uh i don't I don't know. Well, it's because it's trajectories, you know, like uh, propulsions or pushes the obstacles that either stop it or, or make it switch movement or, you know, the, you know I don't know. I, I guess the, what would the role be like uh, in the Zeno's paradox with like, uh, not catching up, but like, uh, <laughs> like, not shortcuts. I'm not exactly sure what I'm saying. Like, because it, it just seems to be, uh, you know, just chase rather than like chase chasing in like an urban like a uh, 
like in Venice, like going through like the cir cir the, the a labyrinth, you know, like like Zeno's paradox in a labyrinth. Um, I don't know. Where they both don't know where they're going, but they're still chasing. I'm not exactly sure if it's a, a clear question, but. Well, uh, if, if, if you're able to move in multiple dimensions, catching up is harder. <laughs> That was a question to Paul, right? Just, oh, that was open comment. I don't know. It was just. I don't know. It's more his area and yours, I guess. So, what was the. Analogy you were making with Zeno's paradox and the robot, oh uh, like a labyrinth. Uh, just what would the role be of like uh, in introducing like a uh, like chaos into uh, the paradox? I don't know. Not, <laughs> I'm not exactly sure uh, what I'm what I'm at. Well, I guess uh, adding obstacles. Like we're assuming that like the the uh -huh. tortoise won't be. This is just going in like a fluid motion rather than, you know, he sees a, a apple or something and wants to eat it. Mm -hmm. or, you know, like, a, like, I don't know, making, making the, the paradox uh, more into Marcus, like a... Zeno, no Parmenides would ever uh, allow for randomness or chaos or whatever they think in ideal thing, uh, terms. And they, uh, if they, uh, if one does not think in ideal terms, uh, uh, if one does not uh, think in terms of pure ideas that are perfect uh, in form as well, um, one is not doing philosophy according to the ancient philosophers. Uh, the, the problem is, and uh, that is what Marx noticed, uh, noticed uh, is that this atavism of thought, this, uh, uh, this atavism of a, perf a presumed perfection is uh, basically what keeps a philosophy trapped into idealism all throughout its history. You know, uh, yeah, there, there is historical development. There are changes in, uh, you know, the history of ideas in Western philosophy, et cetera, et cetera. But there is this atavism, this grain of, you know, uh, an unchangeable problem, which is precisely uh, this one. This tendency to think in ideal forms, uh, in ideal shapes. And that is why uh, the, the first breaking away from idealism and therefore, uh, therefore from philosophy as we know it is the idea of the Klinemann uh, of uh, Epicurus and um, his followers. Uh, so um, that is that's what my comment could be on this. It's simply uh, this Zeno's paradox with uh, chaos introducing in in it is uh, something that could no longer be would no longer be Zeno's paradox. That's what I would say. Um, but uh, you know, I'm not a mathematician and you know, uh, nor a computer scientist. So maybe it's an interesting, you know, ga uh, mind game to to play to to think of it from the viewpoint of a computer scientist, for example. Maybe Paul has a certain idea how this element of chaos would play uh, in, in Zeno's paradox. What would it produce? Would it change the algebra in there if it's an algebra at all? Probably the the um, issue of randomness and the Klinemann is 
connected quite deeply to atomism because when Einstein produces evidence for an atomic theory of light with photons, un uncuttable elements of photons, that generates the, the whole problem of the combination of randomness with what is an ideal evolution of the wave function. So you have an, an, an ideal wave function, whether it's a wave function of light or a quantum wave function. And the fact that you have and atomism imposed on top of that means that particles can only be in one position when observed or when they interact because they are smallest possible cuttable element of light. So um, the apparently random speckle pattern that you get from interference or any kind of low light imaging is the, a necessary consequence of cuttability, uh, uncuttability, sorry, of, of photons. If you, if you take, I mean, the picture I'm getting of, of Katharina at the moment speckles badly. It's all speckly around the, the, the bottom. And this is, an effect of relatively low light intensity and not great quality cameras. Uh, when you, you're doing, you've got relatively low light intensity, poor quality cameras, you're, you get speckles because the modern cameras have such small feature sizes that the random occurrence of photons, the random shot noise of photons is actually perceptible once you, you, once you amplify it and show it on a computer system. Um, now that random shot noise of photons is a necessary consequence of a, the being photons, the, of the being atoms of light you can't get a completely smooth visual field. You get a visual field with noise in it. And this is a, 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 an inevitable consequence of uncuttability. This is why uh, Eisen got the Nobel Prize for his photoelectric effect uh, paper, that light is actually uncuttable. Whereas the classical, uh, mathematical representation of it is as a continuous um, function. So the, the, the same mathematical perfection versus reality that you're talking about exists between Maxwell's equations and Einstein's photoelectric effect. I'm going to have to leave at this point. Uh, I hadn't expected it to run quite this long. All right, yes, uh, I guess uh, it is our time to finish uh, now. It's been an hour and a half. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Paul. Th thanks everybody uh, and the Zoom room and on, especially on the stream. Um, I know that you followed, even though we did not check your last comment, possibly last comments or the questions. So it's time to wrap up. We will talk more about this in the integrated uh, credit uh, courses uh, at SMR. Uh, the enrollments are over and uh, Paul and I will be teaching on more or less this and, and much more. Uh, at the end of December and the beginning of January. Okay, so thanks everybody and see you again in another open seminar.
Okay, bye. Bye.